Please pray with me, spirit of wisdom, spirit of insight, minister to us, your people, we pray. May only truth be spoken and may only truth be heard, we ask. Amen. So, so many of the stories in the Bible and Jesus' stories are about the underdog winning. And uh, we love stories about that, don't we? I mean, that's one of the great themes in literature and movies, is how uh, the underdog overcomes. When I was a kid, I loved Robin Hood. Every time I was in Point Pleasant Park, I'd be pretending I was Robin Hood, right? And, uh, and that uh, story. And then I was thinking of, you know, all the Disney stories have this theme in it. Uh, Millie, I know, uh, the child who comes here, uh, uh, she likes uh, Frozen, the movie Frozen. And uh, Frozen is inspired by an old fairy tale called The Snow Queen. And in Frozen, it's the story of a young princess who sets off on a journey, a difficult journey, to help redeem and reconnect with her older sister. And she goes on this journey with the rugged ice man and his loyal reindeer and a naive snowman to find her sister, whose icy powers have inadvertently trapped their kingdom in eternal winter. And so Anna looks for Elsa, even though she was hurt by Elsa. She overcomes storms, she overcomes the attack of wolves, an evil duke, and helpless odds. And in the story, one of the great themes is fear makes everything worse and hurts people. But love wins the day. And that's the stories of life. And we love those stories because deep in our soul, we want them to be true because deep in our spirits, we know they are true. Love is the only thing that wins the day in the long run. And while fear is a great short-term motivator and controller, in the long run, it doesn't work. And so, so too with the Bible stories. We think of Miriam, Moses' sister, and Moses' mother, and midwives who have no power at all, deciding to save this baby Moses from being killed like the Pharaoh had dictated. And so they hide him in the river, and then one of the princesses finds him and takes care of him. And these women, I'm getting an echo here. These women, uh, they, they, um, they save Moses. And, and, of course, the course of history. That, that's the, the whole stories. And in Jesus' stories, it's the same kind of thing. We saw the story Shelley started reading, where uh, he turns the tables. And those who couldn't find a job and only got an hour of work or a few hours of work got paid a living wage because they needed to feed their families as much as the ones who were lucky enough to have a job to work the whole day. And so these stories of divine turnarounds, stories of God bringing balance to the world, to the ecosystem, the lowly being lifted up, those who are too big for their britches being brought down a notch or two, those who couldn't find work getting a full day's wage for even just an hour of work. And so today, uh, the great story is that those who are struggling to take power and will hurt others to get it, they don't win in the end. And the stones that are rejected become the cornerstones. Wow. You see, given what we're facing in the world today with the rise of fascism around the world, with the rise of fascism in the United States, with the oldest democracy in our neighbor to the south, where, where the democracy itself appears to be in peril. I mean, we could never have imagined it. And so we need to be reassured, just like our ancestors needed to be reassured, who faced worse than us, that in the long run, God's reign will come, and that goodness will come because love is stronger than evil. And uh, we love these stories because they're true. And we live them out in our own ways. When we're not caught up in fear, we naturally care for one another and see that everybody's taken care of. I, I, the, one of the main reasons I joined the United Church was the quality of United Church people. The United Church people I met in different volunteer groups around the city and my teachers, they just impressed me with how caring and thoughtful they were. 
And uh, I married a United Church gal. And uh, when the Browning clan gets together, which we won't be able to this year, I just notice, you know, what you do? You care for the children, right? You pay a lot of attention to the children at first to make sure they're cared for. You care for the elderly, make sure they're comfortable, right? Then you care for one another. That's how we naturally are. And, and that's the Jesus way, where everybody's taken care of. Because we're all equal. That doesn't mean the same. I got a buddy who was telling me he's got three daughters, and uh, two of them are quite brilliant, and one of them has some cognitive difficulties. And he says, you know, I've had to spend a whole lot more money on my child with the cognitive difficulties than the other two, but my other children understand it. They don't resent it. And he said that's what equal is, not the same, but caring for everybody, making sure everybody has a chance for a reasonable life. And so we do these kinds of things. At Christmas time, you know, if a, a guest comes over at the last minute and, and we're all sharing presents, uh, mom or dad will run off and get a little present, right? So that everybody has one. That's the Jesus way. That's the kingdom way. And that's so cool. But in the public arena, we're told propaganda. We're told a different story. We're told that everybody can't win. We're told that there's not enough for everybody. And we're even told that the ones at the top should have way more than the rest of us too. That's the story that's drilled into our heads. But it's not true. It's not true. But a majority of leaders throughout the world support the notion. And I think we, I mean, I grew up believing this. It wasn't until I saw the research over a lot of years I changed my mind. But a majority of readers support the notion, leaders support the notion, that doing the right thing is too expensive. That giving everybody equal opportunities is unrealistic. That caring for the planet will bankrupt us. That paying a minimum wage that someone can live on will throw everybody out of work. That having more millionaires and fewer billionaires will cause a recession. Isn't that what we hear all the time? I mean, some of us may still believe that because it's all we hear. That decriminalizing drugs will cause more addictions. That giving people a decent place to live and food will make them not want to work. Oh man, do we hear that one. This kind of thinking is empire thinking and it's considered common sense. But it's wrong. I think the most cynical thing that the Ford government did when it was elected was to cancel a program that had been set up to verify the fact that if you gave people enough money so they didn't have to worry about where they were going to sleep and what they were going to eat, that they had energy and some desire to get an education and better themselves. Most of that budget was spent. Two and a half years of the three-year program was done, and then they just canceled it and didn't give the money to to look at the data to see what the outcome was. And why? Because, well, we know it's stupid. We know that if you just give people enough money to live and, and, and eat, that they're not going to want to work. And they didn't even follow through, and that's because they just said it was so stupid. Wow. Now, Jesus said, God, the way God works, the matrix of the universe, the way evolution happens, the few lording it over the many is not the future. The hard facts are that Jesus and the fairy tales are right. Everybody does better when everybody does better. Go figure. <laughs> and cooperation is more efficient than competition. By the way, that was proven, and the guy got a math Nobel Prize for that. I'm not just making this stuff up. Every major organization, here's cool, every major aid organization from the Red Cross to Doctors Without Borders knows that the fastest and most economical way to create employment and raise the standard of living for everyone is to educate and get money into the hands of females who have not been given equal opportunities. And the proof of that is that in Canada, both the Harper government and the Trudeau government made focusing on the development and support of women throughout the world their major policy focus in aid and inter-nation inter inter uh, support. Because any time people are left out, we all suffer. We don't think it. 
Ah, they're just gravel. They, nobody can take care of all that. But Jesus said, no. When you give people opportunities, everybody benefits because we're all divine. And uh, so it is when the standard of women goes up, the standard of men go up too. And it's not because women are better than men, it's just that women haven't had the opportunities. And so too with Black Lives Matter and our indigenous people. You know, someone said to me, well, all lives matter. Well, of course all lives matter. But the problem is black lives matter too. And in Canada, if you look at every metric from life expectancy to time in jail to how many people the cops kill that aren't armed to uh, illness to lack of education, if you look at every metric out there, you'll see that black people in Canada and indigenous people in Canada are much worse off than the white people. And so black lives matter is not a statement that white lives don't matter, it's a statement that black lives matter too. And when in Canada, black people and the indigenous people finally are given the same opportunities to just grow up with not having to worry about water they can't eat and shelter and food and a good education, the country will prosper. We will all be blessed. The standard of living of Everyone will increase. That's the good news of the gospel. Isn't that cool? So exciting. But those in power and those who benefit from the system, they don't like to give it up. And in our story today, you see what happens when the owner of the vineyard sends his representatives to get some taxes so things can be shared around, and they don't like that. They even kill for it. And we've seen the exercise of raw power in the United States like never before, but don't, don't think that it's ever been any different. We just have an unusual president down there who doesn't care everybody's seeing. So the matrix of existence is rooted in the value that everyone is valuable. Every part of God's creation matters. Humans don't have a divine right to benefit from the few. To benefit the few at the expense of the many, we are here to share creation and life together. And that's what this table represents. The table of Jesus is a table where everyone is welcome. I'm going to close with a story of a minister. I went to a unique seminary. It's the only one in North America where the Catholics, the Anglicans, and the United Church shut their individual seminaries down and they all joined together. And so in our classes, we had an Anglican priest, a Catholic priest, a United Church minister. It used to get interesting sometimes. And uh, one day a week, we'd go with just our own denomination to learn the specifics of that. So I got to, you know, I know a lot of Catholic and Anglican priests because I went to school with them. And uh, this fellow, Tom, loves to tell the story. At his church, they have a hospitality meal where people come. And then afterwards, those who want can stay and have a little service and receive Holy Communion. And so one day uh, he had this unforgettable experience. He came to a man kneeling and uh, he said to the man, uh, would you like some communion? And the man says, no, skip me, Father. And uh, Tom says, what? And uh, the man says, skip me. And Tom says, why? He says, because I'm not worthy. And you know, we still have people who don't take communion today because they don't feel they're worthy. And Tom says, uh, you're not worthy, you're God's child. Then Tom said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to serve communion to these other people, and then I'm going to come back to serve communion to you, and I would like you to serve it to me. And the guy says, was well, that legal? <laughs> and uh, Tom says, yes, yes, don't worry about it. So uh, Tom came and finished the others, and he came back, and uh, he said to the fellow, what's your name? And he said, Josh. And Tom placed the elements of the Lord's Supper before him and said, Josh, this is the body of Christ given for you. Eat and drink this in the remembrance that Christ loves you. Amen. And Josh blinked back the tears in his eyes, and he received Holy Communion. Then Tom handed Josh the cup and the host, and uh, Josh nervously took the trays in his weathered hand, and he said, Father, are you sure this is legal? And he said, yes, uh, it's legal, just do it. So Josh's eyes were darting around. I didn't know whether he thought the Archbishop of Canterbury was going to come in or the police or something. But uh, he said, uh, 
Finally, he, he gave the trays to, to the pastor, and Josh said, Body, blood, Jesus for you. Hang in there. And Tom said later, Of all the communion rituals I've ever read, I don't recall the words hang in there. But uh, at that moment for me, Holy Communion had never been more holy. And as Josh walked out of the church that day, he was standing a little taller. And he uh, told all his cronies that he had served the priest communion. And so they start nicknaming him Rev. And in this time in our history, as I began saying, we're facing a lot. But our faith stories, found in both fairy tales and in the Bible, and in our lives if we'll look back, they tell us that in those encouraging words, hang in there. Love wins in the end. Amen.